All right, so I like when some of the questions, uh, some of the questions that I get kind of overlap and I can group them together and do a little bit more comprehensive study of a topic. T tonight, I want to look at a few questions that have been raised, both that have been sent to me in, um, in that form that I have for you, and also some that have been raised just one-on-one. -on -one. I wish you'd answer this, or can you explain this, and, and so I can kind of roll some of these together. We're going to talk about angels tonight. And ad admittedly, it's not really my area of expertise. I, I believe in angels. I believe they're there. It's not something I've ever put a lot of focus on. You know, some people are just drawn to, to the subject of angels. Um, that I've, like I said, I believe in them. It's not that I don't care. It's just, I was asking Stella about it today because I said, have you ever studied into this? Because here's what I'm thinking and I want to make sure I don't sound crazy. And she was the only one. In, she and Charlie, I should say, are the only other ones in the office. And Charlie, Charlie doesn't have theological discussions. He wants to talk about minions. So, um, so I asked Stella, do you think I'm crazy? Well, she said the same thing I did. You know, I, I'm concerned about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the, the angels are just kind of there. And I'm glad they are, but I don't really think about it. Um, so I, I've had to do some, some study, and, and honestly, there's no way to cover everything that the Bible says about angels in one study. I tried that with the Lord's Supper a few weeks ago, and we were here for a really, or several weeks ago, but we were here for a really long time as we covered every passage that deals with the Lord's Supper. Um, so a couple of the questions that I've gotten, are there different kinds of angels? And do people ever become angels? And we're going to delve into those tonight. Uh, a question that was raised to me just one-on-one -on -one is, why do so many people think we can become angels? Because, spoiler alert to the second question, no, people do not become angels. And so the question was raised to me a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night, why do so many people think that? And, and maybe I can, I mean, I can't explain why everybody thinks all the things they do. But I may have, a, I may have a, an answer for that one. Uh, but we're going to look at this tonight, what the Bible from, says about angels. I come from the Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You know what? I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's, yeah. That is, uh, that is likely, and it's sad, and it's not particularly shocking. With the amount of our theology that comes from TV and movies and Facebook, that's, there's probably a lot, a lot of truth to that. Um, all right, so let's delve into a little bit of what the Bible says about angels. Because when we think about angels, if I just said to you tonight, we're going to talk about angels, which I did say that, your mind automatically went to what? What are some pictures that came into your mind? A big person with huge white wings. Okay. Wings, dressed in white, probably a halo, maybe a harp, yeah, that kind of thing. Sword, yes, I thought about that earlier too. Um, some, of, some of those ideas, that's, that's what we think about. The Bible uses the word angel to describe more than just that. That's part of it, but we're going to talk about what the, how the Bible uses the word angel. The word angel is just kind of a generic term that's been used... In, uh, in Scripture, there are, there are some words that for whatever reason they just transliterated instead of translated. Like baptism, for example, comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to immerse. One of the things that I discovered was when they were translating the, the King James years and years ago, they didn't want to make King James or some of the bishops mad, so they didn't say immerse, which would have sounded too much like the Reformers, like the Puritans, and they said, let's just transliterate it as baptize. And so we got a new word, baptize. Um, I don't know if angel comes from the same place, but if we were going to trans uh, translate the word, the, the word is used in Greek and in Hebrew, angelos in Greek or malach in, in Hebrew, if we were going to translate those, the word would be messenger. But instead we went with what sounds like the Greek word angelos and went with angels. And so the Bible uses the word angel in kind of this generic way that, that 
most often means the creature that we think of, but it can have all these other meanings which can get really confusing if we don't recognize that it just means messenger. All right, so the ways that the Bible uses this, it uses the uses it for angels in the common sense of the word, and there are there are numerous examples. I didn't even try to put all of them. But just as a as a representative example here, Acts 8.28 talking about the story of Philip going to, to meet the Ethiopian. He was led by an angel of the Lord. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. In all likelihood, this is one of the creatures that we think of with the wings and the halo. Now, did it actually have the wings and halo? I don't know. But it's that kind of being that we think of when, when we think of angels. The second most common grouping of angels that, that we probably think of, if we think a little harder of what we know about what God's Word teaches about angels, there's another group that this is applied to, which would be demons. Demons are the, the fallen angels. So we've got these created beings, and some of them rebelled against God and followed Satan. Um, an example of that is in 2 Peter chapter 2 where he says, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So the Bible describes even the demons as angels. They are, a, a, they are the group of angels that, that fell into rebellion following after Satan. Now, you probably never thought of me as angelic, <laughs> but the Bible does use the word angel as a... As a as a term for pastors or apostles, maybe not across the board, but it does, it does use that at times, uh, because of their role as messengers to the, to the respective churches. In Revelation chapter 1, it says the seven stars, talking about the seven stars and the seven candlesticks at the beginning of John's vision, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And, and a lot of Bible scholars, maybe even most Bible scholars think, that it's talking about the pastors of the churches. If not the pastors, somebody that was entrusted with a message to that church. And as you read through there, and it gives the, the messages to the seven churches, in each case it says, to the angel of the church at Sardis, to the angel of the church at Thyatira, to the angel of the church at Ephesus. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's like a guardian angel for each of those churches that was tasked with the message. It's talking about the, the messenger. And then in Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, you received me as an angel of God. Now, Paul is human. So it doesn't mean that Paul is one of the winged creatures. It means Paul is that the churches in Galatia received Paul as a messenger from God. Okay, There's one more use of the word that I, that I picked up on. There may be others, but these are the ones that I picked up on in this study. And this one is a little trickier to get to, but it's there nonetheless. If you, follow, if you follow how Exodus and John fit together. So there's the story of the burning bush, and you could read through the whole story. I'd encourage that in Exodus chapter 3. I just pulled out the, the logical steps that we need to get there. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. Talking about this same being, it says in Exodus 3, I, he said, I am the God of your father. So the angel of the Lord is also referred to in Exodus 3, just a few verses later, as God. I mean, that, that, that's hard to wrap your mind around, that, that God is, that the Lord is the angel of the Lord until you recognize that angel means messenger. Okay? The same being from the bush in Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, we also know that in the book of John, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus identified himself with the God of the Old Testament. He was not just using bad grammar, all right, because that's why the Pharisees got so upset when he said this, because he was claiming to be the God of the Old Testament. He was claiming to be the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. And earlier in John chapter 1, it says no one has seen God at any time. Contextually, that means no one has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son has declared Him. So the case I'm making to you is that the angel of the Lord 
the messenger of Yahweh in Exodus chapter 3 is Jesus Himself. Doesn't mean that Jesus is one of the winged created beings. It means Jesus was there speaking to Moses out of the burning bush with a message from the Father. And it's not the only time that that happened. There are other instances in the Old Testament where somebody is described as an angel of the Lord, or in the case of Joshua, the captain of the Lord's host, some kind of supernatural being shows up and interacts with, with, with a human. And in some cases, I think it is a, a, a created angelic being. But in other cases, that same being that, that's interacting with the human is not only described as the angel of the Lord, but is also described as the Lord. And in those cases, I believe it's Jesus before the Incarnation showing up um, and interacting with a person. So I mentioned to you last week that I love charts and graphs, right? Trying to keep all of this information straight and, and how we know the differences and what characteristics we need to uh, be mindful of. I made one of these Venn diagrams today. And I use some... I, I, I use some of the, uh, the characteristics that I think are important for us to remember. And hopefully you can read that. You may not be able to see it if you're watching online, so I'll go over what they are. The yellow circle is holy beings, meaning beings that are acting basically in concert with God's will. Now, are human beings ever completely holy by God's standards? No, but we're talking about... But I couldn't think of a better word, a better succinct word than holy, for beings that are basically carrying out the Father's will. So that's the yellow circle. Red, the red circle is created beings. That's any being that has a beginning, any being whose, uh, whose existence is dependent on a cause. Right? You and I are dependent on a cause. We are created beings. Jesus is not a created being, by the way. For Jesus to be God, he cannot have a beginning. That, and I, I need to make that very clear because one of the um, one of the most I, I think I've mentioned this on a Sunday before one of the, the more concerning statistics I've seen that comes out about church life is every couple years or so uh, Lifeway and Ligonier Ministries release what they I think it's called the State of the American Church and they do a, a study of where people uh, stand in their knowledge and understanding and position on theology and even among evangelicals, um, a sizable percentage of people agree with the statement, Jesus is the most powerful of all created beings. Now, my hope in that is that people just aren't listening and they turn their brain off. Oh, of course, Jesus is the most powerful. But folks, if Jesus is a created being, then he's not God. If we're saying Jesus is the most powerful of all created beings, we're stepping into Mormon Jehovah's Witness kind of territory. Jesus is not a created being. He is God in human flesh. So created beings are anything that is created by God, that has a beginning, that relies on a cause. Okay? And that's the red circle. And then you've got the blue circle, which are the supernatural beings. That's anything that exists outside of nature. And in the... I hope this makes sense to you, and if you want, I can try to find a way to print one of these off if you're thinking, I need to go home and look at this more and try to wrap my head around it. In the intersections of these three circles, we can kind of divide out all these things that the Bible calls angels. Okay? So you've got Jesus is acting in concert with God's will. The, the preachers and apostles presumably are acting in concert with God's will and the, what we would call angels, are acting in concert with God's will. Demons, not so much. Now, can God use them to ultimately make His will happen? Yes. But their, their goal is not to be working in God's will. Alright, then you've got created beings. Messengers, apostles, preachers, whatever you want to call them, are created. Angels are created. Demons are created. Jesus was not created. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to anger cat lovers, but, you know, I could see that. Uh, if you're watching online, she said, 
She said, I thought that demon picture was a cat. And I was really confused. You know, well, I, okay. <laughs> it's, a, you know, there is, what is it, uh, Cinderella? That she has the cat, somebody has a cat named Lucifer. So, you know, I watched that movie as a child and uh, told my parents I was going to, I had this toy stuffed cat, told them I was going to name it Lucifer. And my parents were really concerned about me until they realized it was on a movie. Um, I didn't realize it meant the devil. <laughs> You've got supernatural beings, that is, they exist outside of nature. That would be Jesus, the angels, the demons not the preachers and apostles. So, and at the intersection of all the three, holy, supernatural, and creative, you have basically what we're talking about tonight as angels, uh, what we would call angels. Does all of that make sense? Hopefully. Okay. Like I said, I can, if, if you want to take this and this is not, I can't point you to chapter and verse that lays it out like this. This is my brain trying to wrap around what the Bible teaches about each of these groups of beings. But this is helpful to me. For, for our purposes, we, we're looking in this area right here. These are all the original angels that God created, what we would call angels, that God created to serve Him, to carry out His purposes. And then a chunk of them fell into sin and rejected being holy. They, they followed Satan. So, hopefully that helps you make sense of what, what the Bible talks about and what we're talking about when we say angels. Because going forward, our study is on these here in the middle. And the question was asked, and I, you know, I went through... You're saying, why do you go through all of that? Because I want to, I want to make sure as we talk about different types of angels that we're all kind of clear on what we're talking about, uh, that we're looking at these in the middle. So there are different... I saw this this week where they were talking about... Uh, there, there were multiple websites that said, well, in Christian theology... There are nine classes or nine rankings of angels, and I'm going, why have I never heard that before? Okay, that is medieval Catholic Church, Jewish mysticism kind of stuff, right? That is, if there are all these classes of angels in Scripture, I have not come across it. Now, sometimes people will work the principalities and powers and I just think those are descriptive terms. I don't think those are classes of angels. I could be wrong. I found three different types of angels described in Scripture. There may be more. This is what I came up with. I told you I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on angels. I've not, you know, I've not devoted substantial portions of my ministry to studying angels. But there are mentions of archangels. There are actually two mentions of archangels in the New Testament. One is in 1 Thessalonians in uh, the famous passage about the, uh, about the rapture or the second coming, depending on how you interpret it, the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. So we know there's this being called an archangel, but that really doesn't give us much information about what they are. Then there's in Jude 9, uh, a little bit more obscure passage where evidently uh, the archangel Michael and Satan are in a dispute over the body of Moses. And in Jude 9, it says, Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. Instead, in, in Jude 9, he says, the Lord rebuke you. Now, again, this doesn't tell us much about the, the role of the archangel other than the fact that there is one. So really, the only... Again, you could look at all sorts of theological speculation and your nine rankings of angels or whatever else. I, I saw some that have more levels of angels. And just, hey, if you're saying I'm being upgraded to a level eight, you're getting a little too out there in your theology. Uh, the only scriptural explanation I can come up with then is to look at the words and what they mean. And the word archangel is broken down into two words. We see the angelos that we looked at earlier. And the, 
the other is RK, the, the prefix there, which is, it, it means a ruler. You know, if we, and we have that in English. If, if somebody is, is the king or queen of a country and they rule by themselves, we say they are a monarch, right? Um, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples with archy. Well, anarchy. Anarchy. An is the prefix that means no. Anarchy is when there's nobody in charge. It's, it's just mob rule. Oligarchy is a, you get this. So, arche means a ruler, a chief. Um, my best guess on what this means is that even angels have supervisors, right? <laughs> and, and Michael appears to be one. Are there others? Scripture doesn't say for sure. Um, Gabriel is the only other angel I can think of who is named personally in Scripture, but I didn't see a mention of Gabriel being an archangel. I think we assume that he is, um, and he may be, but I didn't see any, anything specifically saying that he is. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting, because we can get, way, we can get too focused on angels. We, can, we make a mistake if we act like they're not real, but we can also focus too much on them. Paul wrote to people that uh, he was concerned because they were maybe bordering on the worship of angels. We can get too far that direction. Um, Michael, the archangel, presumably being like their supervisor, is one of the more powerful angels. But even he, as he was dealing with Satan, who, well, I guess Satan was, Lucifer is also named as an angel. Uh, so the three that are named are Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer battling Satan over the body of Moses, he didn't bring a railing accusation. He didn't try to fight him on his own. His answer was what? What did I tell you a minute ago? The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. Even the most powerful angels ultimately rely on, on the power of God to do anything, which I thought was important for us to notice. Beyond that, the scriptures themselves, we can speculate a lot. We can see what people think and what mystical ideas they have, but the scriptures themselves don't really say much about archangels. The next group is the cherubim. Um, Charles said this reminded her of Sister Act. I, I, if, you've, if you're familiar with the song, Holy, 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 we sing about cherubim and seraphim. <laughs> when I see this word, it always makes me laugh because I go back to my, my time in college working at Homeland and a lady came in one day and found me as she was desperate to buy some cherubs. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, you need to buy some what? She said, I need to buy some cherubs. And I thought, is this some kind of ethnic thing that I don't know? Because I worked in the far northern part of South Oklahoma City. And so I went and got one of my Spanish-speaking co-workers and said, is this a do you know what a cherub is? She said, I don't know what a cherub is either. Later on, we discover she wanted those little cherry tomatoes that come in the container that are called cherubs. <laughs> so I see, I, I see this word and I think cherubs every time. That has nothing to do with the lesson. It's just a, how many opportunities do I get to share that story? Cherubim is the, uh, is the, um, is the plural form of, of cherub. And we think of cherubs as these, uh, these sweet little angels, the chubby babies with the wings. That is not what they are because a lot, of the, a lot of the mentions of cherubs in the Old Testament have to do with the Ark of the Covenant or designs in the temple. But one of the few places that it actually talks about who they are and what they do is in Genesis chapter 3 where it says, God placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned away every uh, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So, in one of the few descriptions we have of cherubim and what they do in the Old Testament, they're described as kind of like the special forces of the kingdom. I mean, they are not the cute chubby baby angels that 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 people take photos of and post online. They are like God's flaming angel of vengeance out there with the big sword, like like Sharon said came to mind the the sword. Um, so they seem to be angels just based on that limited description. 
they seem, at least to my way of thinking, to be these angels that go out and exert power at God's direction. They're, they're sort of like the muscle. Not that God needs them to do that. God could snap His fingers. God could speak a word. God could just will it and it would happen, but for whatever reason, He chooses to work through them. There's this other class of angels that are mentioned in Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 6, it's the one place they're mentioned. They're called seraphim. Um, Isaiah chapter 6, this is where Isaiah gets the, the vision of God in His holiness in the temple and he's overwhelmed. Uh, it says the train of His robe, that's God's robe, filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With the two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And when Isaiah sees this vision, he just falls all to pieces. And he says, Woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And the other mention of the seraphim is right there in that same chapter where it says they picked up coals off the altar and, and held them to Isaiah's lips to purify his lips. Those are the only mentions of seraphim in Scripture. Now, based on that, I, and I, I tried to do more research into what these meant. Uh, the Hebrew word seraphim is very closely related, or it may even be the same word as far as I can tell, to the fiery serpents. The Bible talks about fiery serpents like in the book of Numbers. I was reading an article about seraphim. I think I've told you I'm afraid of snakes, right? I don't, I don't like them. I, I don't. And they don't like me. And it, I mean, it's all mutual. I, I can't even, I don't even like to look at pictures of them. I, I have to, now Charla has said, why, why can you watch the crocodile hunter? Because I know that they're going to be there. And so I'm expecting it. And plus Steve Irwin's there and I know it's going to be okay, right? Uh, it reruns. But, but if they just pop up on a commercial, I mean, I'm, there's a 50-50 chance I'm going to scream like a woman and drop to the floor. I was reading an article today about seraphim and a picture of these bright orange serpents on the, on the ground in the Middle East came up and I, I may have shouted a little. <laughs> and and that's, I think that's where the conversation with Stella started. And I, I told her that, and I said, have you ever heard this? And, and, and she was talking about the serpent in the garden and you know maybe it makes sense the serpent in the garden and and Lucifer being an angel and I said hold up now if if there are bright colored snakes flying around the throne of God uh, heaven has suddenly lost some of its appeal for me <laughs> I you know so I I don't know honestly what that connection is all about or what the seraphim look like I'm hoping that it's not these saw scaled vipers or whatever they call them um, once I knew it was there, I went and looked at the picture a little more and read the article. But um, well, since I had six wings. Yeah. Is that the only place that the, the angels are talking about having wings? <sighs> That's a good question. That I don't know. Um, it's the only place I recall them being mentioned as having six wings. It talks about them, I, I think it describes them flying, talks about them being the heavenly host, but I don't recall a description. You know what? We can look real quick. That's what, Cherubim's that's what, had wings. cherubim's had wings, okay. There's several mentions about how, how big the wings were. This, the wings of the cherubim were 20 cubits and overall wings. Yeah. Now, is that, is that part of the description of the Ark of the Covenant? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that may not be what they actually looked like. I mean, that part of the description of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. So that may not be what they actually looked like. I mean, that, well, but that's what they were told by God. Right. 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 I don't know, but that's, that's, awesome. that's the closest we can get. Um, Luke chapter 2, I mean, that's what we're doing here. We go to see what the scriptures say. Luke chapter 2 is where the, uh, the angels appear to the shepherds. Behold, an angel of the Lord, uh, this is Luke 2 9. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is a Savior born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. So it doesn't even say there that they flew, although we could read that into the statement that they left from them to heaven. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mention wings there either. What about in Revelation? Not that so that yeah, this Revelation 4, 4, 10, I think is what it says about. Marilyn's on top of this tonight. Uh, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or not, saying, Holy, 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 Lord, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Where is that? Okay. Uh, Revelation 4, uh, 8. Uh, and see, part of my problem in, in saying here are, and, and I think I told you, this may not be all the mentions of angels in Scripture. Part of my problem with stuff like that is I don't know if they are what we would consider angels or not. Yeah, I mean, there's... Because it does also talk about a woman with two wings, and they're like wings of eagles, mm -hmm. and that in Revelation also. Yeah. So, yeah. And I had... I need to spend more time studying Revelation one of these days when I get time. I, I purposely stayed away from teaching on it for years and years because, well, there were some people I was pastoring that were more interested in understanding prophecy than doing what we knew we were supposed to do now. So I stayed away from it. And then I said, okay, you know what? Years into it and a few churches later, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach through the book of Revelation on Wednesday night. And we got to about chapter 4 and... COVID-19 came up and people started thinking it was one of the seals being opened. <laughs> so it may it may uh, may be a while before I attempt revelation again. I broke the world last time, right? Um, but there's so much there's so much of that that I don't understand. Those might be angels, they might be something I, There's some kind of created being, I know that. You do something that I think is a little bit odd. Um, in my study Bible after it, it gives you a, a description of verse, mm -hmm. explanation. It goes from chapter in, in Revelation 4 7, and then it skips to 4 9. It doesn't explain 4 8 with the four living creatures, each having six wings, <laughs> and full of eyes. Yeah, and even the, the Bible commentator just noped it right out of there. Right over <laughs> that. <laughs> That's cheating. So, uh, that's funny. <laughs> All right. So if you didn't hear that, if you're watching online, Bob is looking at his study Bible where it's got a running commentary of all these verses and an explanation for each verse underneath it. And uh, Revelation 4, four yeah, four seven it gives a description, an explanation. Four nine it gives an explanation. It's just totally silent in the explanation on four eight where it talks about the living creatures. So they apparently they weren't brave enough to attempt it either. Yes. Um, it is in Hebrews one fourteen. It's right before that is a question about, I, I, and I don't know, I didn't read all of this, but it, in chapter or in verse thirteen, it talks about, or it says, but to which of the angels has uh, has he ever said, sit at my right right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? And in fourteen it says they are not on ministry spirit sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. So is it saying that the, I mean right there it doesn't say that the angels have wings and it's a question. Right. Too. Okay, and you what say it's a question, or was that a question sent to us, or you're saying it's a question? No, it's a question for, okay, in in verse 13, was that the first one you said? Okay, uh -huh. to which of the angels has he ever said? That's a rhetorical question, because what he's talking about is Jesus, and if you read back to the beginning of Hebrews 1, he's, um, he's talking about the superiority of Jesus over everything that they knew in, in, their, in the Hebrew religion. And... So he's saying, to whom, to which of the angels have I, ha, has the Lord ever said, I'll do these things? And yet he said it to Jesus. So he's making the case that Jesus is superior to the angels. And then in verse 14, he says, they're all, you know, are they not all 
the point um, I'd need to see it in the Greek I, I was taught there's a certain construction of a negative you construct it a certain way if you're expecting a yes answer and you construct it a certain way if you're expecting a no answer kind of like we say you're not going are you we're expecting a, a no answer or we say you're going aren't you we're expecting a yes answer kind of like that in Greek I've, I'm assuming based on the way this has been translated into English when he says are they not all ministering servants he's expecting a yes answer that the angels are just servants of the Lord does that answer what you were bringing up I was just reading something in uh, an article or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how trustworthy it is, but it's but how it says that they were the spirits are sent for, mm -hmm. meaning they're not mentioning wings there. They're mm -hmm. just being sent. Right. So, anyways, I was just yeah. thinking. I don't know. Yeah. I can't think of any other. You said the cherubs have wings, and we've got that with the descriptions of the Ark of the Covenant and the, the descriptions in the temple that the cherubim and the seraphim have wings but there's a lot of there's a lot of descriptions that don't that don't mention wings and and there's even some descriptions in the Old Testament is it uh, is it where two or three angels show up to Abram and Lot and so they they're not they're not all Jesus, and may you know maybe that none of them are Jesus, and they seem to blend in with everybody where they don't realize they're angels. So it's possible that they only have their wings only show up when they need them. I don't know. It's a lot of speculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And and the Bible says that even now we uh, entertain angels unawares. You know we. Maybe in the presence of God's angels, and they may just look like people. They're not people, but they may look like people. Do you think that, that this verse will came in, in Hebrews 1 might be where a lot of people get the idea that they have guardian angels? Could be. Because they said they were sent to, to minister to people who would hear of salvation. Yeah. You know, that, I, mean, I hear a lot of yeah. people talking about guardian angels, that we have assigned guardian angels. Yeah. And, you know. and, and I don't necessarily object. I don't have a scriptural objection to the idea of a guardian angel, but it's just not something, again, I've put a lot of stock in. My trust is not in an angel because ultimately it's, it's God's providence that upholds us and his, they're ministering spirits. They are, they are tools that he employs for that purpose. So um, whether we have guardian angels or whether God uses guardian angels to protect us or whether God protects us directly it's the outcome is the same for me it's one of those things we'll find out later on so, so could um, it be something like in Daniel 9 did you mention anything about I don't think I did okay so it says yes while I was speaking of prayer the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision of the beginning being mm -hmm. caused to fly swiftly reached me about the time of the evening offering yeah so maybe just people who, you know, Gabriel's an angel, mm -hmm. he's flying, so all angels have wings. Yeah. It just could be someone's idea. Yeah, could be. Mm -hmm. So I, But I think looking at this, we can kind of, we don't want to be dogmatic about it. We don't need to be dogmatic about much of this, but I, I, we can kind of come to the conclusion, I think, that maybe... Some angels have wings and some don't, or maybe they have wings at certain times and they, you know, they they can and they don't always. If they're showing up in human form, they're definitely not having wings. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, so, and and I brought all of this up about the seraphim and the cherubim and the archangels in response to that question: Are there different types? Now, if you're saying types, and I don't know who sent this question, uh, but if you're saying types in the sense of, you know, they're, they're set in stone. Like, there are certain types of people, right? There are men and there are women. And at the risk of getting kicked off of YouTube, <laughs> draw your own conclusion. If, if you're saying that about angels, I, I don't know. Um, cherubim, seraphim, archangel, all of those descriptions to me seem like they're kind of tied to what they're doing. 
And so my guess, my guess is that as far as types of angels, it's not talking about, you know, there are different species of angels, more like different assignments. Because the seraphim seem to be focused on worship. That seems to be their job. In, in, again, the limited description we have of them in Isaiah. Uh, they're, they're there worshiping. They're flying around the throne worshiping. Uh, the cherubim are, are out guarding the fort. They've got the, the sword, and they're the ones you don't want to mess with. Um, could an angel be taken off of cherubim duty and put on seraphim duty? You know, God can do what He wants. I, I don't know how that works. But I, I'm assuming, again, just based on the description, that it's more like an office that they hold or a function that they hold rather than a, um, like a species type of thing, if that makes sense at all. So are there different types? There are different types, but how we answer that depends on what you mean by type. Um, and then the other thing about people becoming angels. Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase and so we can get through this and, and say, no, people do not become angels. Somewhere along the line, we've gotten that idea. And I think people find that comforting, that, um, that a lost loved one, they've gotten their wings. And I, I remember each time I've had a child pass, somebody has said that to me. The, the second child was stillborn, so we, we even had a funeral and all that, and I remember more than one person coming up and saying, well, the Lord got another angel. And I was nice, although my wife says I don't really have a poker face, so there's no <laughs> telling what reaction I gave them. Um, but later on to my parents, I was like, why do people feel the need to say that? And my parents were like, they're just trying to comfort you. I was like, the truth is comforting. <laughs> yeah. The, the truth is he's with Jesus. I don't, I don't need to be comforted by the idea that he has become an angel because it's, it's just not true. And now there's nowhere in Scripture that expressly says we, be, we don't become angels. But there are all these things that are taught in Scripture about the nature of humans and the nature of angels that we can pretty well piece together. And I'll, I'll give you two instances today. And, and by the way, I'm not saying you're a bad person if you've ever said they become an angel. I... I think people are well-meaning in saying that. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a cranky old preacher, so they said that to me and it kind of struck me wrong. But two, two of the for instances that I think are different between people and angels, we have different natures, first of all, and we go back to Hebrews here. Hebrews chapter 2 says, what, quoting the book of Psalms, by the way, says, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Now, in, in one instance that talks about Jesus Christ being made lower than the angels, meaning he took on humanity, because we were created different, differently from the angels. We were created with a different nature. We are a different kind of being. And in our nature, we're just a little lower than the angels. Um, Ironically, it seems to be that God loves us more. And yet in our nature, we're lower than the angels, probably in the same sense that animals are lower than us. So we have a different nature. And the idea that we, we die and become angels doesn't really fit the biblical worldview any more than the idea that your cat dies and becomes a human in heaven. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not how that works. Um, we have different natures. We also have different destinies. And the, um, the Apostle Peter wrote about this. And it's a, little bit, it's a little bit long to get to what we're talking about. About three verses here. But he says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So he's talking about the, the gospel. The gospel has been at the center of the prophet's message. Um, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who preached the gospel to you. So he says those prophets in the Old Testament didn't get to see the fulfillment of the gospel, but they were preparing you for the gospel, uh, which was preached to you by the Holy... Uh, excuse me by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. And some other translations make this even clearer that the angels look at the gospel and it's a mystery to them. They only wish 
that, that they could experience this forgiveness and salvation that He offers. They only wish that they could experience this adoption into, into God's family that's part of the Gospel. And so, the Bible nowhere speaks of the ability of angels to be forgiven. You know, you've got the angels that still serve the Lord and they'll get to be with Him, but those fallen angels, they don't have another chance. Um, Jesus did not die for the angels. And that's where I said, it seems like God loves us more in spite of the fact that He designed us a little lower than them. Uh, we don't have the powers. We don't have the, uh, the, the supernatural side that they have. But He loves us more because Jesus came to die for us. Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. And so where we come from is a little different, or at least our nature, how we were created, is a little different. But also, also our ultimate destiny is different from the angels. And it's so much better. The angels look at the salvation that we're offered. They look at the relationship that, we're, that we get to have with the Lord. And they look on that almost with envy. Not like a sinful jealousy, but a... Man, I wish I could have that kind of thing. And so, the, Bible says, the Bible says that we're created in God's image. We are. And the angels were created to worship Him. Yes. And they were created, uh, what was it, Hebrews 1.14, as ministering spirits. They were created to serve Him to our benefit. Um, it, it's really amazing. And so... If any of you have ever said anything like that about somebody turning into an angel, please don't think I'm coming down on you for that or I'm saying you're, you're dumb or you shouldn't have said that. Um, I, I have a replay reel that goes off in my brain in the middle of the night of all the stupid things I've said. And I've said way worse than that. Things that I, I wish I'd never said. Okay? That, that's minor. That's minor. It's worth correcting. It's worth changing how we understand it. But I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad about what they've said. Um, and again, most people would find that comforting if it was said to them, I'm just a cranky old preacher and that's, <laughs> that's, that's how I roll. But it is, it is worth understanding our loved ones don't turn into angels. We're not going to turn into angels. If we belong to Jesus Christ, we get something far better than having to be the, the help in the kingdom. We are adopted into the family, and, and I think that's incredible. And the, just on a closing note, and, I, and then I'll take any questions or comments you have, but on a closing note, I hadn't thought of what you said about the um, It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> that's very possible where that came from. I was, I've been racking my brain trying to think where, where do people get the idea um, that we become angels. And, and all I could think of is what Jesus said in, in com when He compared us to the angels. And He, he said, in heaven, we will be, in heaven, men will be like the angels in the sense that they won't marry or be given in marriage. He, he was using the comparison to angels to make a very specific point to the Pharisees about the earthly nature of marriage, that that's not something we're going to worry about in heaven. And that's a question I get a lot when I do Stump the Preacher, is will we know each other even if we're not married? I, I, think, we will, I think we will recall the relationship. There will be a special bond there. It's just not, it's not the same as what we have here on earth. But I don't think our memories are going to be wiped either. That, that might be a question you want to submit, and we'll come back and talk about it later. Oh yeah. And it's talking about all the little children that die and mm. become angels because they never they didn't have long on earth. You know? Oh yeah. And so that may be where some of that got started also back in the I don't know the name his name, probably in like forty, thirty, fifty years. I Could saw be. it in grade school fifty, so yeah. Movies probably play a big a big role well, in all that. It's a pretty little story. Yeah. 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 And and there's you know, there's nothing wrong with stuff like that if you recognize that it's, it's a story. I, it's been a long time since I've seen It's a Wonderful Life, so I wasn't even thinking about that. I still love the movie, even if it's got some, some questionable <laughs> theology in it. You know, you, you still enjoy the story. Um, 
But, but that's, what, that's what I thought of. Maybe some people thought, well, Jesus said we're going to be like the angels, but they missed the comparison that He was trying to make. So, anyway, if you've, if you've said that, it's okay. It's okay. But we just need to understand we get something better than being angels. We get to be part of the family.